Welcome to lecture 13. Today we'll find about what goes on within a warehouse. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the tasks which are carried out within a warehouse, the various functions fulfilled by a warehouse, as well as consider which areas of the warehouse often shows great inefficiencies. First and foremost, it is important to note that in a warehouse, the tasks are focused on product flow rather than product storage. The objective for warehouse management is really the fast and efficient movement of products through the warehouse. In order to achieve this, the warehouse manager must maintain timely and accurate information about the products being stored at the warehouse at all times. The goods in the warehouse may arrive via various transportation modes. Road cargo may arrive in full truck loads or in the form of loose cargo known as LTL less than truck load. Air cargo arrives by plane and will need to be transferred to warehouse by truck. Sea cargo arrives by ship if it is FCL, full container load, the container will be offloaded from the ship, placed on a chassis, and transported to the warehouse using a prime mover. If it is loose cargo, LCL, less than container load, it will be transferred to the warehouse by truck. The first step of the inbound process is receiving. There are three levels of receiving checks. Firstly, the warehouse person checks the identity. Is this the correct product? Secondly, he or she checks the quantity. Does the number of units tell you the shipping documentation? Lastly, he or she checks on the quality. Depending on the product customer requirements, the quality check can be simply checking the exterior for visible damage or involve detailed checks such as batch number and expiry dates of the products. After receiving checks are completed and the products are confirmed to be in good saleable condition, they are transferred into storage locations within the warehouse. In some cases, a shipment may be divided up or regrouped by specific products before storing in distinct storage locations within the warehouse. This is usually to facilitate more efficient order fulfillment at a later stage. In some cases, products arriving at a warehouse are transferred directly from inbound to outbound without being put into storage. This is known as cross-docking and usually happens within 24 to 48 hours of the products arriving at the warehouse. Cross-docking contains elements of break bulk and consolidation. For example, four containers of pharmaceutical products from manufacturers in four different European countries arrive at a regional distribution centre in Singapore. After inbound checks have been completed, the products are sorted into three shipments to be sent out immediately to three different countries in Asia. Cross-docking works for such high-value products in high demand as the combined transportation costs are lower than if the four manufacturers were to send separate shipments to all the countries in Asia. Products which are confirmed to be in good saleable conditions are transferred into storage locations within the warehouse pending picking or customer order fulfillment. There are various types of storage systems. Pallet racking is used for storage of palletized cargo. Shelving is used for the storage of cartons or small packages. Tote boxes can be used for the storage of loose parts and various components. There are also many types of storage systems customized for storage of just about everything. For example, aircraft parts often come in various non-standard sizes which require purpose-built storage systems. Storage can be on a temporary or semi-permanent basis. Most storage is considered to be on a temporary basis as the emphasis is on moving the goods through the supply chain for sale to the end customers. However, in some cases, storage is designed to be semi-permanent for various reasons. Many countries maintain national stockpiles of N95 masks and other associated items to be prepared for major outbreaks of infectious diseases such as SARS and flu. For example, the Singapore Ministry of Health has 16 million N95 masks in the national stockpile. While badges of these masks are issued to the government hospitals regularly for routine use, new stock is being brought in continuously to ensure the inventory in the stockpile remains more or less constant. Similarly, world governments have also invested some 9 billion globally to stockpile influenza drug Tamiflu in case of a flu pandemic such as the swine flu pandemic which resulted in the deaths of a few hundred thousand people globally in 2009. On a lighter note, there are products which are maintained in long-term semi-permanent storage to allow for appreciation of value. One such example is wine. Wines of good vintage are aged under tightly controlled storage conditions in order to develop in flavour and hence appreciate in value. It is not uncommon for vintage wines to cost several hundred thousand dollars per bottle. In some warehouses, it has also become the norm to offer value-added services or VAS for customers. VAS usually involves making some changes to a generic product from the manufacturer. For example, for a printer, this can include 
changing, changing the instruction manual to one of a different language, changing a plug head to a different model, or even adding labels in a different language. So why is there a need for VAS? Let's consider the same printer again. The manufacturer has two options. Option 1. Produce dozens of variants with different plugs and instruction manuals in specific languages. Or, option 2. Produce one generic variant with the most commonly used plug and standard instruction manual in English. Substitute accordingly upon order drop. It is quite clear that option 2 is more cost efficient and more cost effective. Option 2 is the approach known as late stage customization or postponement. The manufacturer optimizes production costs by producing as few variants as possible. The generic products are then shipped to the regional distribution center where the product is customized as late as possible through additional assembly, packaging, labeling, etc. Overall, the objective is to minimize wastage or rework of excess products produced for any particular market. For example, an inbound shipment of 10,000 units is received at the warehouse. The forecasted annual demand for Thailand is 3,000 units and highly stable. Immediately upon completing inbound checks, the warehouse customizes 3,000 units with Thai plugs and instruction manuals. The Thai customized stock is put back in storage and ready for picking when orders are received. This is known as the build to stock approach. On the other hand, the forecasted annual demand for Vietnam is 300 units and highly uncertain. The warehouse only customizes specific units with Vietnamese plugs and instruction manuals when actual orders are received. This is known as the build to order approach and it avoids having excess products customized for any particular market which might later require costly reworks. In the outbound process, the reverse of the inbound process happens. When a customer order is received, it is entered into the warehouse system. This triggers the picking and packing of the products required in the order. When completed, the order is staged at an outbound staging area pending collection by the transporters. For sea shipments, full container loads are stuffed into the container and trucked to a port by prime mover. The rest are trucked directly, just like sea shipments and air shipments. Sometimes for various reasons, goods which are dispatched out of a warehouse will get returned. Upon receiving such return goods, the warehouse needs to conduct returns inspection. If the products are found to be in good saleable condition, they will be put back into storage. In some cases, some repackaging may need to be done first. If the products are damaged and not saleable, they are quarantined in a separate location in the warehouse consolidated for disposal at a later date. Besides the tasks related to managing the inflow and outflow of products, there are also numerous other tasks performed by people in a warehouse. A significant amount of work goes into facility management. This includes taking care of lighting, heating, air conditioning, water, electricity, toilets, pest control, cleaning and waste disposal. Very often, there will also be a customer service team located within the warehouse that serves as an interface with the customers. They take orders, handle customer inquiries, expedite priority shipments, track and trace shipments, provide proof of delivery and may also do billing. Warehousing has three basic functions, movement of products and storage of products. Each time movement or storage takes place, there is information transfer. Let's take a look at how these functions take place at each step of the warehouse inbound and outbound processes. During the inbound process, products are un unloaded from a vehicle, inspected for quality, then their identity and quantity is verified against shipment notification documentation. During the put-away process, products are transferred into warehouse storage locations or staging areas. The warehouse inventory records, where the manual and the warehouse management system, the WMS, are updated to reflect the new addition of inventory. During the outbound process, products are picked and mixed as per customer order requirements. The WMS provides the information used to generate picking, packing slips and delivery orders. Once orders have been picked and packed, they are sorted and staged at appropriate outbound staging areas until the carrier arrives for pickup. After the products are loaded into the carrier's vehicles, the WMS is updated to reflect the subtraction of inventory. Thus, it can be seen that information transfer occurs during all warehouse processes simultaneously with the movement and storage functions. This is very important because managers need timely and accurate information to manage the warehouse. The key information that is necessary includes inventory levels, inventory turns, warehouse occupancy and customer order fulfillment. Within the warehouse, it is important to eliminate any inefficiencies in movement, storage and information transfer. 
One of the key ways of clearing a warehouse often comes from movement inefficiencies. There may be redundant or excessive handling, which may even lead to excessive maintenance costs and downtime. Another key ways is in the warehouse space. Poor layout leads to underutilization of floor space, with many visible blank spaces not used for anything in particular. Poor design leads to wasted airspace, in which the full vertical height of the warehouse is not utilized optimally. Both types of waste <coughs> affects the cost efficiency of the warehouse, as the warehouse operating cost is a fixed overhead regardless of how it is utilized. The last key waste often occurs during information transfer. In a traditional warehouse, there can be many types of redundant and excessive paperwork. There are many forms to be filled by hand, checked by supervisors, and eventually filed in the office archives. Today's competitive marketplace demands more precise and accurate handling, storage and retrieval systems, as well as improved packaging and shipping systems. As such, it is important for a warehouse to have a mix of manual and automated systems, optimal for the products that it handles. With that, we have come to the end of Lecture 13. Till next time.